You have a Bible? You have a Bible? You got one with you? There's one in the pew? How many of you got a Bible on your phone? Hey, there we go. We're very fortunate in this country. We got Bibles everywhere. Uh, they're floating through the air in the, in the, the waves right now. You know what? You get a Bible everywhere. We're very, very blessed. We're going to talk about the Bible this morning, but the Bible and society. And uh, I love my Bible. I, I appreciate it a lot. It is one of the most miraculous things you'll ever hold in your hand. It's a copy of God's Holy Word. God calls it the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And I don't know what we would do without it. We're very, very blessed. Stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, please, this morning. We've got three wonderful passages of Scripture about the Word of God here today to read for you, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get done. First of all, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16 and 17, it says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Our second passage is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And lastly, here's a verse from, uh, from, the, from the lips of Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 18. This is what Jesus says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, that's for us that would be the dotting of the I or a crossing of the T, piece of a letter. Not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we love you. We praise your blessed and holy name. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God, that it is life-changing and transforming. Thank you that it is the word of the one true and living God, and it always, always does what you says that it will do, Lord. Pray that you will bless our time together. Give us a renewed sense of faith in your holy word. To walk closer to you, Lord, and remember the purpose of the Bible is not just to know more stuff about a God, but it's to draw us ever closer to you, Lord. Pray that you fill me now with your Holy Spirit to bring a message for you, your honor, your glory, in Jesus' holy and majestic and almighty and lovely name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When it comes to the Bible, we believe it's the Holy Word of God. Our Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. The books that you have, those 66 books in that Bible that you carry, these have passed uh, uh, scrutinizing and, and stringent testing down through the centuries to prove that what we have here we call the Bible is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is, uh, it is given to us for, as the Scripture said there, that we might be complete in everything that we do. That there's not an answer to life that you cannot find in the Word of God if it can be found anywhere at all. There's not a, a, a situation that the Word of God does not address. There's not a person that's ever lived that the Bible will not be relevant to. The Bible has the one single only way to salvation, the way to get to heaven. It is all in the Word of the living God. It is the Word of God, so whatever God says happens. Whatever God says is true, it's true because God said it. That's what makes it true. Now, in our uh, at Southern Baptist, in our uh, uh, doctrinal statement, the, uh, the, the, the Baptist faith and message, First thing on there is what we believe about the scriptures. So we as, we as Baptists and we as Christians and me as pastor, this is what we believe. We believe that it is given by inspiration of God, which means it's breathed out of God. That is complete just the way we have it. And it's good for everything that we need. And it is the sole and only rule and measurement about everything that we believe. Nothing uh, outside the Bible has power and authority over the Bible when it comes to what we believe is true, what we believe about God, about ourselves, about anything else in the world. We always turn back to the Bible. Why do we believe what we believe? Because we can show it to you in the Bible, in the Word of God, and that's it. Nothing supersedes the Bible. No, no uh, council, no group of people, no, uh, no divine master that walks around. It's only the Word of the living God, only Jesus, only the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Word that they have given. And that is what we believe, that's what we preach, that's what we teach, and that is what we try to live in accordance with. Amen? Amen. Now, in, I started saying recent years, but that's not true. 
The Bible has always been under attack. And the battle is raging today, and it looks like we're losing. Our current society does not believe in the Bible or in the God of the Bible. Do you know from the Bible, do you know what the first recorded words of the devil are? In the Garden of Eden, the serpent talks to Eve. And he strikes up a conversation. The first, first words out of his forked tongue is this. Has God not said? And he gets in an argument with Eve. And then he says, God's not telling you the truth. So from the very get-go... The Bible has shown us that it's going to come under attack. That the first thing that the powers of darkness ever did was to cast doubt on the truthfulness of the Word of God. Has God really said that? Did He really mean it? No, that's not true. God was wrong. God is lying to you. God's withholding things from you. And so the argument has always been, you can't pay any attention to what the Bible says. Well, now, here we live in a society today in our country that that's pretty much the norm. Nobody much believes the Bible anymore. Have you noticed? Watch your TV. Look on YouTube. Watch, a, watch society around you. Listen to, to, to the politicians. Listen to the, the, the popular culture. And you'll find that, in general, the Bible is kicked to the curb. It is no longer taken as, a, as an authoritative voice of an authoritative God. Our Bible is, is uh, believed to be uh, a bunch of myths or nice stories or certainly cannot be believed. It's, it's, it's believed by society to, to, uh, to be completely wrong in terms of, of science and education and history and rights and all these other issues. And so, and so bad light's been cast on the Bible over and over and over again. And we've managed to kick God out of the public schools. We've managed to kick God out of government. And the only place left for God to go is to go to church. Amen? You know, God still goes to church. He still comes to my house. How about yours? Right? When you, you give God the boot, well, what do you think is going to happen? And so when you, when you undermine the, the foundation, what happens to the building? Jesus said you need to build your building on a rock, not on a shifting sand. But what we live in today is a society that's full of shifting sand. There are no, there are no, uh, there are no moral uh, moorings for what is right and for what is wrong. Our, our society believes that the Bible is no longer authoritative and that that means that the God of the Bible is no longer authoritative. They believe that, they, they believe that, that God, the God of the Bible, uh, is uh, irrelevant that he's not engaged in, in, in human affairs. That it no longer, it, it, if it ever did, it doesn't matter what God says, okay? Now, as, as I've told you many times here, what we believe and what we think and what we argue about everything all goes back to this. We can argue opinions, we can argue ideas back and forth all you want to. But at the end of the day, our ultimate example is, why do we believe this? Because the Bible says so. So if society, if someone else says, well, we don't believe your Bible, well, that's the end of my argument. Now you have to take it up with him. Okay? Take it up with him. Because I have no other argument that does not eventually find its genesis. See what I did there? It finds its genesis in the word of the living God. If we... And he, here's, the, here's the problem. We... People don't have anyone to say, this is right and this is wrong. This is good, this is wicked. And I'm not just talking about whether you tell lies or not, or whether you steal or not, or whether you kill or not. Because the general consensus is, well, it's best not to tell lies unless it's just good for you. And don't steal unless they have it coming. And don't kill anybody for sure. And so what we have is a society that basically believes this. That you can do anything you want, as long as you don't hurt other people, as long as you don't infringe upon their rights. <coughs> Does that not sound like the culture we live in today? Anything goes as long as it doesn't harm another person. As long as everyone is consenting. As long as no one's hurt. As long as no one gets their feelings hurt. Is it humanly possible to live a day without hurting someone's feelings anymore?
So we live in a culture that's got their feelings on the sleeves, sleeves and, and everybody's offended about everything. And you can stand for rights, you can stand for this, that, and the other, but don't stand for Jesus or you're going to get in trouble. And what we, what we end up with, folks, is this. We end up with a, a salad bar religion. When you go to the salad bar, what do you do? I mean, do you, do you get that pickled okra? Me either. You do? Put that one on the prayer list right there. <laughs> I'm going to get steak if it's there. I'm not going to get chicken. I'm get chicken at home. Right? I say, I like this, I don't like that. Well, I'm going to have some of this, but I don't want any of that. Salad bar. So when it comes, so when it comes to um, who I'm going to marry, I like this, I don't like that. And I'll pick what I like. When it comes to how I deal with my finances, how I raise my kids. When it comes to politics, oh, I'll have some of this, some of this, some of this, but I don't like this a week. I don't have it. When it comes to my morals and my ethics, well, I like this, but I don't like that. So I'm going to kick it to the curb. Because there's no reason for me to take something off that salad bar if I don't like it. Now, in the Old Testament, the Bible says this, in the days of the judges, it says, in those days there, were no, there was no king in Israel. Therefore, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Talk about a recipe for chaos, anarchy, and disaster. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Until when? Until God established a king for them. So that there would be a, an authority over them to say, this is right and this is wrong. You can do this to them, but you can't do that to them. And someone needed to come along and, 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 and enforce the laws of God. And so today we take the, the same salad bar religion some analogy and we apply it to everything that the Bible says. Listen, remember I told you the Bible has answers, has information, has commandments and ideas and insights into every single part of life. Remember he said that the man or the woman of God may be completely furnished for every good work. All of it is in here. So that means if I throw my Bible away, now I can salad bar it all I want to. How, how do I act to this toward this person? How do I act toward that person? What kind of a person am I going to be? How am I going to treat the truth? What am I going to believe? How am I, what about my, my, my politics and my, and my finances and my, my marriage and my raising my kids and, and, and right and wrong the way I treat other people? All of it is just everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. And so in a country our size, there is no end to the different groups that have different criteria for what they believe is right and what they believe is wrong. And it can be anything from, oh, we're just supposed to love everybody no matter what they do, it's fine as long as they don't hurt anybody or infringe on anybody's rights. All the way down to the fact that other people believe, you know, it's me and mine and everybody else got to get out of the way. And we'll do what we have to do to get our way. And it's, you know what I'm talking about. The gray spectrum in our society about what people believe is right and wrong, good and bad, has been completely destroyed. We are, we are a society that's built on shifting sand. And it changes every day. Have you noticed that? You know, I'm almost 29 years old. Amen, aren't you? <laughs> Plus a few. And in my short life, I have seen major, major changes in our culture, in our society, what's acceptable, what is unacceptable. And I could talk on and on, but I'm just not going to. Well, I'm a preacher, probably will, but anyway, you know what I mean. And the words that come out of people's mouths, and the way they act on social media, I just shake my head. I'm a dinosaur, amen? I feel like a dinosaur. There's an old song that says this, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen? The angels beckon me to, to that open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. This is what the Bible says. You can expect it. You're not going to fit in. The old King James calls us and says that we are a peculiar people. We're different. We're odd. God told us in Corinthians, he said, come out from among them, be ye separate, says the Lord. I'll receive you, I'll be your God. You'll be my sons and my daughters. But don't think you'll ever fit in. 
Jesus said this, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So when you have no, when you have no foundation for right or wrong, anything else, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, you, you never know what people, how people are going to act, what they're going to do. Because no one has the right to tell you you are wrong. Amen? Have you noticed that? No one, has to, no one has the right to tell you you are wrong. Well, you're not the boss of me. As long as I obey the, you know, the, the civil law, everything else is none of your business. But the Word of God says something different. The Word of God tells us that we're all in this together. And what you do affects more than just you. That what the Bible calls sin is like a hand grenade. It hurts everyone, you and everyone closest to you. The difference between sin and wickedness is this. Our world believes in evil, wickedness, and sin. Evil, evil, evil and wickedness, I'll get it right. But no one believes in sin. Because sin is not just doing something wrong. Sin is an offense to God. So if I kick God out of the equation, there's no such thing as sin. I can do bad things to other people, but I can't sin against God because there's no God. Which means that uh, he, he, he doesn't have anything to say. He's irrelevant, and so I throw him away. But in the process of getting rid of God, in the process of getting rid of his laws and his commandments and, and his precepts and the things that he says that we thou shalt this and thou shalt not there of the whole Bible out of all that what we, what we do is we get rid of not only his commandments but we also eliminate his blessings and his promises and the hope that we have in Christ. He, you eliminate the power to get your prayers answered. You eliminate the most important part of the Bible, which is this. The Bible, this book that God has given us, is His way of connecting you to the God who made you and the God of the Bible. This is the pathway. This, this, is, the, this is the methodology that God says, you read my word, you believe my word, and as a result of that, you and I will get together. And that's what our Bible is for. There's a, there's a book in Ephesians that says that in, in previous times you were, you were lost, you were without Christ, you were alienated from the promises that God made. You were without hope in the world, without God and without hope. So when you throw your Bible away, when you say, well, it don't mean anything, it's not important. Or, or God doesn't, God's not the boss of me. The God of the Bible, he's just maybe one of many gods out there. After all, the Hindus have 300 million gods. All right? And so, and so he's just one of many. Jesus was just a good person and a great leader. Look what happened to them. We don't, sure don't want any of that. When we, when we take away the deity of Christ and the veracity of the word of God, we're left with just handfuls of just dirt and it's not going to help us. And we have eliminated the very source of life and light and power and help and love and mercy and joy and peace and all the other blessings that God has for us. The only way to truly have those things is with a relationship with the Lord God Almighty, the God of the Bible. Amen? That's the only way there is. People can tell you different. They say, well, I've done this and I've done that. But remember, the Bible says that Satan has covered people's eyes and they can't see the truth anymore. They believe in a lie. Well, I can be happy without God. Well, good luck with that. I can, I can have a fulfilled life. I can, I can be rich without God. Well, good luck with that. And you know, maybe you can. Maybe you can act like a happy person. Maybe you can get rich. Maybe you, it can go far in this life all without God. But that's the point. You are still without God. And there's coming a day, no matter how wealthy and handsome and popular or successful or happy or joyful or anything else that you have. There's coming a day when this thing right here will stop. And like the Bible said in our verse, we are all naked and open with, with him to whom we have to give an account. There's a judgment day coming. And the, and the Bible is, is, is quick and living and powerful and searches the motivations of our heart. And everything's written down in God's books in heaven. And you will be judged on your judgment day according to what God wrote in the Bible. We'll be judged eternally by this. And there'll be no arguing with God says, well, you know, dear God, I just didn't believe all that stuff. And I never asked you for anything. And I'm not as bad as this other fellow over here. And God says, that, that day's never coming. 
We think you're going to argue, you think you're going to argue your case before God on Judgment Day. Judgment Day is not, is not court day. Your Judgment Day is sentencing day. The trial is over by then. You know why? Because the trial is today. Today. In the days of our life. Once we leave here, there's no arguing with God. There's no presenting your case. You present your case now. The Bible says, there is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. The judgment. It's sentencing day, good or bad. Heaven or hell. There's no arguing with God on that day. It has to be done in this day. Today, the Bible says, is a day of salvation. Well, the Bible says a lot of other things as well. Amen. People say, well, you know, the Bible, it's, it's just a group of, we don't really know what it says. It's been around for 2,000 years. I wrote something down. Let me find it. I wrote some things that I cannot find. But let's talk about ancient manuscripts for a minute. Here's a little bit of, uh, of uh, history for you, for you history buffs. Okay. How many of you remember guys named Plato, Aristotle, and Homer? Okay. Plato. Not Plato, Plato. Okay. We have seven manuscripts of Plato that people have discovered. Okay. Aristotle. We have 49 manuscripts from Aristotle. Homer's Iliad, very popular book, because we have 643 manuscripts of Homer's Iliad, ancient manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. Okay. Er, uh, the New Testament, 5,600 separate manuscripts of the New Testament. Early translations of the New Testament into Latin, Aramaic, and Syriac, whatever that is. 19,000 of those ancient early translations. Which means that we have over 24,000 different ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. <clears throat> Which means that, that people who study these things, that they that, that we've proven with with let me get this right, ninety-nine point five percent measurable accuracy over the last two thousand years. There is no question of what the Bible says, what the New Testament says. I don't have the information of the Old Testament, you can Google that, okay? There's no question about the words of Jesus. Not with, not with 24,000 different documents to look at and compare and say, well, this 99.5, measurable. That's good enough for me. Is it good enough for you? Nothing, nothing else out there in, in history comes even close to telling us this is what the Bible says. Exactly. Because God has honored his word down through the millennia. Amen? Just that way. Now then, what does that, what does that mean to us then? Well, it means a few things. It means that you can trust your Bible. We know exactly what it says. We know what the Bible says. You don't have to wonder. Now, you can look at different translations if you want to, and that'll be fine. I tend to study several because they're uh, English translations, and uh, I need all the help that I can get. You know? Uh, but I also have, you know, I'm, I'm a preacher, so I got all this stuff. I also have ways to click and double check the the Old Testament Hebrew or the New Testament Greek. Not that it means a lot to me, but it helps me to understand what the Bible actually says. And so if I compare these different English translations, I get a good idea of what the original meant. Because, you know, I only speak English and not much of that. Amen? Okay. But I can read and study my Bible. And I can know for certain what the Bible says and what God meant about it. And then I can take that and I can apply it to my daily life. And here's the magic of the whole thing. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is living. It is a discern of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, the Bible says. And Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle will pass away. Everything will be happening exactly as God says it will be. Which means that when I apply the Word of God to my life, that is what unleashes and opens up the power of God's Holy Word. And the same power of God in Genesis that said, let there be light, that same power of the Word of God in Johnny's life can say, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. When you walk through the water, you won't drown. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. Because I am your Savior, and you belong to me. 
That same word of God says to me, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The same word of God that said, let there be air and, and water and critters says also to me that uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God can say to me, He's not giving me the spirit of fear, but of love and a power and of a sound mind. And the Word of God can say to me, Do unto others as He would have others do unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and don't worry about all these other things. And the Bible, that same Word of God and the power of God, can say to me, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? Amen? Listen, folks, I'm on my way to heaven. I got one foot in heaven right now. Amen? I do. How do I know I'm going to go to heaven? Because I'm such a fine fellow. The Bible says different. God says, you're not coming to my place because of your goodness, your morality, your righteousness, your holiness, your morals, your ethics, the way you voted, what you do with your money, the way you put in your wife and kids. You're coming to my house because you've been born again by the Spirit of God. You've been adopted into my family. You're a child of the living God. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. you know, he, God says, you called upon the name of the Lord. You really, really meant it. That means that you put yourself under the authority of Jesus Christ. And you put him in charge of all that stuff. You, know, you, you might be a good jumper, but you'll never jump to heaven. You can't jump that high. You can't be that good. Okay, All of a sudden, it comes short of the glory of God. And the way to sin is death. But if you call on the name of the Lord, the Lord, the ultimate authority, the master, if you'll reinstate God in your own mind and heart and life where he belongs in the first place, that he is the ultimate authority, that he is the solid rock. If you will do that, God says, if you'll put me in charge of things, make me Lord over, make me master over, put me in charge, make me the big boss. Put yourself under my authority, under my leadership. If you do that, I'll take care of you. I'll bless you. I'll go with you. I'll promise you a, a better life now and some blessings and get your prayers answered. I'll give you things like love and joy and peace. I'll give you some hope, something to look forward to. I'll give you something worthwhile doing. I'll help you become a much, much better and complete and more fulfilled person than you ever would have been without me. I'll bring light into your darkness. I'll put pep in your step, joy in your heart, a song on your, in your, in your, on your lips and a big grin on your face. And when your day is done, you'll go to heaven and come home to where God Almighty is. And finally, we're just getting started. These are the promises that belong to me now. These are the blessings and the truths and the power and the glory of Almighty God through the Word of God that belong to me now as one of His. And if you've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've if you humbled yourself before Him, if you've admitted your desperate need of a Savior, and, you, and you've done these things with Jesus, and you spent that, that time in serious, earnest, open prayer. Doesn't have to be long. There's no magic words. But you took the initiative to say, you know, Jesus, I believe you died for me on the cross. You rose again the third day. You're alive today and I want to belong to you. I need to go to heaven when I die and I need some help on down here. And you really honestly and sincerely mean that. You put yourself under his authority. Then you have got the promise. You have got the eternal promise of God's holy word that he wrote down on paper with ink and put in your hand. God says, if you do that, I guarantee you, you'll end up in heaven. And that's how I know I'm going to heaven. Can God lie? Can God lie? Well, no. He can. No matter what He says, it turns out it's going, to, it's going to be true. And so we get to stand on the promises of God's Word. And we hold on to that. Does that make sense to you? So, what are you going to do? Well, let me tell you what. Hang on to your Bible. Read it. Study. You say, well, I don't understand it. Well, read it some more. Read your Bible. Well, I don't like to read. Hmm. Get a Bible on tape. Or you know what? Just, just, just suck it up. Read the Bible. Read your Bible. Find one that makes sense to you. Find you good English translation. Okay? There's a handful. If you want a, want a really, really easy one to read, there's the NIV. I prefer a New King James. I like an English Standard Version. I grew up with the King James Version. There's nothing like it. But it's hard to understand sometimes. Well, whatever floats your boat. But be sure that it's a good, solid translation of the living Word of God. And read it. Read your Bible. When I first started in the ministry, I found myself reading all kind of books about the Bible. Oh, listen to different preachers all the time. I was always getting books and reading good books about the Bible. I mean, good ones, you know. Uh, 
Charles Stanley, Chuck Swindoll, Adrian Rogers, you know, some of the greats. Yeah. One day it occurred to me, I've read all these books about the Bible, but I've never actually read the Bible. So I said, how about this? How about if I actually read the Bible instead for a while? And I'll tell you what, I got hooked on the Bible. And I don't read near as many books about the Bible as I used to. I like the Bible. I'm particularly fond of a few books of it, but that's neither here nor there. But this is, this is God saying, let's get connected. This is God saying, let me tell you vast amounts of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Let me tell you millions of ways how I love you and how I'm taking care of you. What to expect in life. Let, let me give you countless answers to life's questions. And let me give you endless strength for the questions that there are no answers to. Let me go with you. Let me be with you. Let me be your father, your God. Let me look out for you and take care of you. Let me help you grow. Let me, let me see how strong you can be. Let me give you some good discipline. Let me develop those things inside you. That's what the Bible is for, to connect you with the Lord God Almighty. It's what it's for. Read it, study it, meditate on it, the Bible says. Meditate on the Word of God and learn to love it. And mo most importantly, apply it to your life. Amen? That's what your Bible is for. Don't neglect it. you got Bibles everywhere. Make the most of it. The ultimate question is this. You ready for this? Here's the ultimate question. Does the God of the Bible have the right to tell you what to do, what not to do, how to live, and how not to live? That's the question. Does the God of the Bible have the right to tell you how to live your life? Yes or no? The problem is God tells me not to do stuff and I want to do it so hard. And I'll come up with arguments, you know. Well, you know, it's, it's the way I am and, and uh, I'm not going to hurt anybody or infringe on anyone's rights. It's nobody's business but just my own. So the answer to the question then is God have the right to tell me what to do or not to do. He has the right. I know that in my heart. I just don't want him to. One of the reasons why it took me so long to become a Christian is because I just didn't want God bossing me around. What a fool. What a fool I was. But that uh, stormy night in 1978 when I asked God to save my soul, best thing ever happened to me right there. And I've never, ever regretted it one, one single second. Amen? Amen? And God can tell me what to do all He wants to. God can convict me of sin all He wants to. Matter of fact, I, I encourage Him. I need it. Because one of the things that God does through His Word is it changes the way you, you think and and he gives you a hunger and a thirst for more of him. And when I see what he's done for me, and when I read his word and, and it opens up to me and my life is transformed, I just, I just want more of that. I want more of him. I want more of his word. I want, to be, I want to be more alive and living and powerful in my life. There's a person that I want to become. I'm not there yet. And only by the power of the word of God will I ever get there. You understand what I'm saying? There's a better me in my future. And I want to be that guy. I want to be that man. I want to be that husband and father and grandfather and pastor and preacher and neighbor and American and human being. I yearn to be a better version of myself. And I've learned in these four years that the way to do that is get my life more and more in line with the old book. The Word of the Living God. Amen. Will you let God tell you what to do? Well, that's kind of a crazy question because He's already told you what to do. The question is, will you do what God of the Bible, will you do what the Lord of the Bible tells you to do? Will you make Him Lord in your life or not? That's how you get to heaven. That's how you know Christ here. That's how you get your prayers answered and all the blessings of God. Will you do that? That's a decision that you and I have to make only for ourselves. Let's pray. 
Lord, we want to thank you for you and for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you haven't just left us down here wandering around in darkness, having to figure it out on our own. Thank you, Lord, that we have a better plan that you've given us than just following our own reasoning and logic and desires and wants, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, it isn't always pleasant. It doesn't always make us happy. But it always makes us better. And we want to say thank you for the Bible. We're very blessed in this country that we have complete access to the word of the living God. And Father, we just want to pray again today as we are face to face with this choice, with this decision as to who is Lord of our lives, who we are going to follow, who has the right, and power, and authority to rule over us and tell us what we can and cannot do. Dear God, we want to thank you that today we have the opportunity to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us and strengthen us, Lord, in these ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.